I'm Bob Goff with Love Does, and this episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. So this week, we're doing something a little different. We've talked about this new team of producers that we have inside San Quentin, but listeners haven't had a chance to get to know them yet. So we came up with this idea, which is kind of a trial by fire. We asked each of them to come up with a story, then think about who they were going to interview. They had to edit it and work with our producers to sculpt a small story. Not a full episode, just a short story. We're calling it a magazine. There's five different stories, each about something here at San Quentin. And we're going to listen to them for the first time right now and give them feedback and hopefully also celebrate with them. I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Erlon Woods. This is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. First up, we have Steve Brooks. And Erlon, for some reason, this guy calls himself the voice of San Quentin. Do you think at this point he deserves that title? Uh, That self-appointed title? You know, San Quentin been around since 1852. (laughs) So this dude's old. So let's find (laughs) out. This is Steve Brooks. I'm an investigative reporter for San Quentin News, and I'm following a new craze sweeping through San Quentin. In every housing unit, classroom, hospital, church, at AA meetings, and near checkerboards, chess sets, and domino games. You can hear the beeping sounds of a detonator and the hot, buttery explosion of translucent endosperm being penetrated by high-pressure steam. Thin, fusible bubbles forming as the pericarp is burst by the water vapor at a pressure of about nine atmospheres. Yes, you heard it here first. There's a microwave popcorn craze happening inside San Quentin, and it is ooh, so good. Popcorn is stupid popular right now. This is Marcus Buckley. I spoke to him at a big event that was occurring on the yard at San Quentin. I'm talking about you could get butter, kettle, we got all type of popcorn right now, but you know, I pop in the can still, old school like grandma. I just like it. I like popcorn, you know? That was Tim Hicks, the sports editor for the San Quentin News. I happened to run into him while he was carrying a bag of popcorn. The way it smell, you know, that aroma, you know. I didn't used to get popcorn two, three years ago. You know, it's been a while. So when I finally was able to get some microwave popcorn, the buttery kind, the flavor kind, oh, man. So there are a couple of reasons for this recent popcorn craze. One of those reasons, I'll let my friend Marcus Buckley explain. Because they, we got microwaves. <laughs> so this year, for the first time, incarcerated people have access to microwaves inside of their housing unit. The reason why? Governor Newsom's California model. The idea behind this is to make prisons more humane. So now that we have these new microwaves, they've decided to start selling microwave popcorn in the prison canteen. But here at San Quentin, we're only allowed to go to the canteen once a month. And a lot of guys run out of popcorn way before then. So there's one other option here at the prison. So how much does popcorn go for in the canteen? 75 cents. This next guy we're gonna call Anonymous for reasons that will soon become clear. Rumor has it that there's also some popcorn being sold outside of the canteen, is that true? I believe so. And do you have anything to do with that? I don't have anything to do with it, but I know somebody that knows somebody that's selling the popcorn. So uh, Steve here is really on some investigative reporting type shit. I know. I mean, it's not the kind of stuff we normally do. So it really pricked my ears up. And I actually know that there's a rule that incarcerated guys can't sell things to other incarcerated guys. True. So Steve, 
So what do you think? Should we change this dude's voice? Uh, definitely. He was providing some valuable information. He was just trying to be honest. I, I think we should do it. And how much do they sell it for? A dollar twenty-five a bag. And so that's a markup. Is people buying it at that price? All the time, yeah. If somebody you see somebody buying popcorn all the time, what would you what would you think? That they have a popcorn habit. That they're spending more money buying the popcorn from this guy than buying it from the store. Do you see that as a problem? Why would I get in a business with buying a popcorn when this guy's clearly making his money and you know I don't want to hit on his hustle? Well, I mean, how how do you th so just put yourself in that position for a minute? Say it was you. We know it ain't you, but just say it was you. Mm -hmm. Would you feel guilty that maybe I'm feeding somebody's habit or, or addiction? No. Why? It's just popcorn. That's it. It's just only popcorn. You want to buy some popcorn? Come buy some popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> The lines in the Michael oh, was too long. Way too long, yeah, way too long, because they need more than one. Yeah, we only have like one or two sometimes. We started off with two, went down to one, now we got none. In West Block, where Marcus Buckley lives, the lines for the microwaves are long. People are getting into arguments and fights. Microwaves are breaking down on a daily basis. They was industrial microwaves, they wasn't meant to 700 people, you know what I'm saying, on one microwave, yeah. The microwaves are in constant use, so they're starting to lose power. Now, it's taking even longer to pop that corn. You gotta put four, four and a half minutes to cook a, a bag of popcorn, which only but take you like two and a half minutes on the street. It's steady going over and over and over, so the microwave never getting a chance to reset. So it really ain't cooking at the highest point like it's supposed to be. So now the microwaves are working slower. The lines are getting longer. People are getting more agitated. There are even rumors of arguments and fights. And not only that, here at Ear Hustle SQ, we've got another problem. This is Steve Brooks, the most accurate investigative reporter for the San Quentin News. I'm sitting here with Ear Hustle's own Dr. Nigel Amanpour. Nigel, how are you doing? I'm good, but I'm not a doctor. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> My bad. I'm mostly accurate. Yes, you gave me a, you gave me a higher degree but than But you're I the am. doctor of podcasts. All right, I'll take that. I'll take that. So, Nigel, let me ask you a question. Yeah. And I know the answer already, but I just need to hear from mm -hmm. you. You love the smell of hot, buttery, microwave mm -hmm. popcorn. No, 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 no. Huh? When we are here working... We're like engaged in our work. All of a sudden, this smell comes wafting over our wall. Oh, no, I don't like it at all. It smells like rancid butter. So first it's the smell that distracts us. Then it's the... And the beeping noise is horrible. It's the, one of the worst things to happen at San Quentin, this popcorn craze. Wow. So at the end of the day, what does this all mean? A rising number of microwaves and a rising sale of microwave popcorn. It's all coming together to create the perfect storm. Some are possessed by this hot, buttery treat, while others are appalled by it. Black market sales are up and addiction rates are climbing. Many are now reporting that they are powerless over their popcorn addictions and that their very lives have become unmanageable. God, God, grant me God, the serenity to, to accept the things, 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 things I cannot change, and the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Welcome to PA. The most important person at Popcorn Anonymous is the newcomer. Do we have any newcomers today? <laughs> yeah, I'm Steve Brooks, and I'm an addict. Hi, Hi Steve. Steve. Today we're working on step one. We admitted already that we powerless over our addiction and our lives have become unmanageable. All we can wonder now is what will happen next. In the words of Marcus Buckley, Popcorn is stupid popular right now. From the San Quentin News, this is Steve Brooks reporting. 
you're you not even being accountable. You haven't even admit that you're powerless over popcorn, bro. Mm-hmm. Huh? You are powerless over popcorn. I've seen it. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. I, I do love your personality coming across in this. You are you are Steve from beginning to end. <laughs> and you also do something that we don't do in our show. It was this real mix of parody and trying to do real reporting. So um, how did you feel about doing the story? Uh, at first, I thought it was a joke. Um, it's not? Then, <laughs> but then I, but then I, then I thought about it, and I said, you know, this is a, this is a very important story. You know, this is a, we living in a new age here at San Quentin, and so it's now a new rehabilitation center. I think we we have to follow important stories like this. So, so popcorn's part of rehabilitation. Absolutely, it's part of. I mean, you pop into a new person here at San Quentin. It's kind of a transformative experience on all levels. So, Steve, one of the things I think would have been good is to figure out how to kind of pull the threads on some of those emotional topics that you started to get into, like what happens in the lines and when there's tensions and fights. Um, how do people feel about that? So, um, you know, what kinds of memories does it bring up for them? That kind of stuff. So maybe push push the emotion a little bit in your next story. Definitely. I'll definitely do that. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate that. That was a great uh, first story. So, kudos. Next up, we have Tom Nguyen. But I don't know. What's your story, man? So my story is about the new phenomenon on the yard, the gazebos. Ah, the gazebos. Yeah, I've been curious about those. So let's hear it. So about two months ago, I was coming down the yard, headed towards vocation, and I saw these wooden picnic benches with space for about six people and a little roof attached to it. The first thing I thought was, what the hell are these? They look so weird. They're uh, light stained wood. It really sticks out in a place where most things are metal and the colors are really dull. And it's strange that they have this roof on them because in prison, the officers like to be able to have clear line of sight to you, and the roof of the gazebo is covering their line of sight. So soon they were on the yard, and a lot of people were just thinking the same thing I was, like, what the hell are these things? Oh, the first time I saw the gazebo on the yard, I was amazed. Never a million years, not a million, I don't even down 10, but... I never seen one in prison in my life. Well, I thought it was like bullshit, you know, honestly, when I first heard gazebo on the yard, that's not happening. And then to see it, I'm like, wait a minute, that's an actual gazebo. What the f- Said, holy shit, a gazebo in San Quentin. (laughs) Now all we need is a hammock, you know what I mean? (laughs) When I came down to the yard and I seen him out there, sprinkled about on the yard like some lower level tree houses is what they look like. <laughs> they weren't that inviting. I felt like I was going to be back in my cell if I went in one of these gazebos. Everybody was kind of hesitant at first. They was like, what the hell is this? You know, and they didn't even know if they was allowed in the gazebo. So they was like, what is this? This is Steve Brooks. He's the guy you just heard doing the popcorn story. He told me that these gazebos like the microwaves, are part of this larger vision of turning California prisons into something closer to what they do in Norway, which some people consider the most humane prisons in the world. I even heard a rumor that these so-called gazebos may have been actually made in Norway, but that seemed crazy. So I dug around a little bit, and I found out these gazebos were actually made in the vocational building located right off the yard. So uh, Bruce and me just walked through the work change for vocation, Looks like a little uh, workshop back here for like woodworking. And that's where I ran into Kenny. Warden Ron Broomfield, he came in and said that, uh, and I guess he had found these pictures of these gazebos in the Norway prison. So he brought a picture of them and asked, would it be possible we could make them? We told him, yeah, and we just drew up some plans. So they figured out how to make one of these things. Then Kenny's coworker Steve told me they had to figure out where they would go. We couldn't just build one because we had to think of transgender, black, Mexicans, Asians, 
and others. So if you built, for example, one table, blacks don't want this guy sitting with the blacks. Just basic prison politics is why we had to build different gazebos for different races. When you guys did that, was that the incarcerated people coming up with that idea or was it the uh, staff? The inmates got to give their input, but the staff run it. It's not just that every group gets one. It has to be put in the exact right space for that group. For example, the, we got different sets of blacks. If I put the gazebo in this one certain area, it wouldn't be right. Because this certain group would say, hey, why is the gazebo over there? So blacks got at me. And I told them, we'll keep it neutral. We'll put it in the center. And that solves the problems for the black area. When the gazebos first hit the yard, some people wondered why, if this is the new San Quentin, are the gazebos being placed according to race? I asked Glenn Jenko about this. He's been in and out of prison for the past 20 years. When you talk about the uh, separation with the race, how would you feel about people saying that um, races being segregated on the yard, yeah. having their own area, is against rehabilitation. I believe you can't just throw people into the ocean, you know? You gotta crawl first before you begin to walk, and inmates that have been behind this wall for a significant amount of time have been conditioned for years and years at a time. They cannot just undo it overnight. You know, like, uh, you will make another man uncomfortable, and he'll react to it. You believe one thing for 30 years, and then someone tells you to start believing this, it doesn't happen overnight. Glenn actually thinks what would make San Quentin a better place is to improve the relationships between incarcerated people and the officers. Maybe those are the groups who should integrate. Between the officer and the inmate, we're two groups that don't function, normally function together. So. If a correctional officer can treat me as if I'm not an inmate and start giving me the interaction that I can use in the real world beyond these walls, then it'll give me more incentive to remove the barriers also. And maybe the gazebos could be a part of that. In fact, according to Steve Brooks, that's the real goal for the gazebos, providing a place for COs and incarcerated people to interact. So I think the gazebo idea is an idea to be able to bring officers and incarcerated people together to do some type of things together. Sit inside the gazebo and, uh, and uh, whatever issues you got going on. I mean, I could just see like an officer sitting on one side, an incarcerated person sitting on the other, and the officer just yeah. saying, how's your day going as far as your rehabilitation program? Yeah. You know, or do you, know, do you want a haircut today? I'm one of the best haircutters there is. Do you want a haircut? Or do you want to play some dominoes? You're talking all that shit about dominoes. Maybe we can sit down and, and solve this, you know. But it's an officer and it's an incarcerated person. It's meant to just kind of like help bridge that gap, okay. you know, between the two. I was really curious what the CEOs would have to say about this idea, that they could have a different kind of relationship with incarcerated people. But to answer that question, I needed to find one who would actually talk to me on mic. Luckily for me, Officer Wallace, a correctional officer who used to work near the Ear Hustle studio, said she would. The idea about these gazebos, for example, yes. on the yard, was that for the incarcerated people and officers to be able to sit and, ha and have conversations, uh, how would you feel about that? I have no problem with that. Because I talk to everybody. I still do. Everybody comes and talks to me. It doesn't hurt to talk and have a conversation and laugh or smile in prison. Who cares? You know, a lot of people don't even realize how, what you just said, a smile or somebody listening to you for a moment, how it could change. Like, for example, my attitude. Officers in the, in the past, because of the way that it was trained, was to punish and uh, just, you know. Well, you already got punished when you came in, right? Yeah. You got punished, you went to court and everything else. Whatever you did is what you did. Yeah. Doesn't mean you're going to still be that person when you come in. It does take a minute for people to change, but people do change. It's really amazing. So it sounds like you're on board with the idea that officers can now be an active part of an incarcerated person's rehabilitation. Well, definitely. I totally can see that happening. But Wallace told me she thinks she's in the minority here, and other COs may not really agree with her. So sometimes you got to watch your P's and Q's, and you know how that is. Because I'll be uh, judged and looked at and criticized, probably. We appreciate it, Miss Wallace. 
This is Thumbwin reporting from San Quentin for Ear Hustle. I'm amazed that on your first story, you got an officer to talk, to have an officer just sit there and and express herself and her beliefs. That was That's dope. Yeah. How was it? Uh, I was fortunate with her and because she used to work down here. Uh, officer Wallace, I think her attitude about just people in general is pretty pretty cool, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I did try with four other officers first. And as soon as the, they asked me what the <laughs> questions were and I told them that I'd be asking about the Norway model, they said no, they shut me down hard. That's interesting, though, to have the state issuing the Norway model and then the people that are not um, accepting it is the people that actually work here, you know? No. That's that's the crazy part. Well, it sounds like it's not just them. The guys aren't either. They're, they're still on their thing about race. We've got to have all the... I, 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 I see it both ways. Uh, if they're still uh, insisting that they have to be broken up by race. I, I kind of agree with you. Like, you know, I think it's both sides. But you definitely took on a challenging subject for your first story. So um, congratulations on your ambition. Thank you. Up next, we have the first of our two Tonys. This is Tony Tafoya. That's me. You are our inside managing producer, and you've been here the longest, so we have high expectations. <laughs> Definitely with your high story. expectations. Definitely. I hope I live up to your expectations. When they first came on Monday, they locked everybody down. They didn't want no movement. And the anxiety was up. Everybody's on, on just yelling out the cell, just waiting. Give us the tablets where they at, just having fun. And then finally, like around 9.15, they started calling people. Like, they called you down there. They gave you accessories. They gave you the earbuds with a mic. They gave you the charger. And they gave you the actual tablets. My tear, as soon as everybody came out, they go, what are we going to do? There was like 30 of you guys, and I, all I heard was, hey, man, we're going to have private phone sex. And one guy goes, yeah, man, I've been doing it in the pay phone. But there's like 30 guys lined up, and I'm thinking, damn, all this time I've been waiting, and you were standing in the booth having phone sex next to 30 guys. Every incarcerated person at San Quentin and throughout the entire state was issued a tablet for free. The tablets are run by a company called Viapath, Each of us gets 20 free text messages a week. And after that, it's five cents a message. You can also pay for subscriptions to movies and music. All in all, these tablets have changed the vibe at San Quentin in a big way. So everybody's on the tier on a tablet. Like nobody's actually in my building for, you know, I don't see anybody watching TV. I don't see anybody doing anything but having their head down on a tablet. It's turning to the outside world. It's actually turning to the stuff that's you know, on the street. Like people walking into me, looking at their tablet, and go, if we're really trying to be like people on the streets, hey man, you know, might as well walk around looking at tablets, bumping into people. You know, that's what's already happening in two days since my building got it. You guys had it for like a week. This is Global Tail Link. You have a prepaid call from... Tony. Tafoya. An inmate at... The California State Prison, San Quentin, San Quentin, California. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? Nothing. I'm cutting out some dies for my scrapbook. What are you doing? Oh, you're about that craft life right now? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so before I got the tablets, if I wanted to talk to my mom, I had to go downstairs, wait inside this half a mile long line, and uh, sign up for a one 15-minute phone slot to use the landline phones in the housing units. Now, I can talk to her whenever I want, and I do. What do you think of the tablets? Uh, For the most part, they're really good. I mean, they've changed, you know, easier to talk to you and not have to worry so much about being right by your phone 24 hours a day because you only get one shot at calling. Oh. It's been nice, and the texting's been very nice, too. Do I call you a lot? No, you only call once a day, but I mean, in the beginning, you called a lot. (laughs) But this way, I mean, I can say, I can think about something and text it to you and not have to, you know, remember it for later or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you wish I called more or do you wish I called less? I think you called the right amount. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, man. Love you. Love you, bye. In the pre-tablet days, people used to argue over the phones all the time. Like, for example, maybe someone wouldn't get off the phone even after their 15 minutes were up. Or sometimes people would just cut you in line. Now, all that drama is just over. Well, like in North Block, because there's like 800 of us in the phone line, it would be like just packed. There's 12 phones. So we would have like 30, 40 people just lined up. The first day we got it, it was three people on the phone line. Like no more arguing, no more uh, fighting over the phone, screaming at each other. And I just feel like it's way more peaceful now. Tablets let you make phone calls from your cell, but that's not all they do. They also let you do what we call video visits, which is basically FaceTime. Now when something happens on the outside, you can almost be a part of it instead of hearing about it later in a letter or a phone call. My name is Jesse Milo, and I have been incarcerated for 22 years. Fourth of July, my cousin in Oahu had messaged and she's like, hey, would you like to video? Would you like to see the ocean? from the island in Oahu, right? And so for me, it was like I was there. They were barbecuing on the ocean, her and the rest of their church in Oahu. And I seen my cousins that I hadn't seen since they were like five years old. And now they were grown women with babies. <laughs> I did. She was like, hey, that's Gordy, that's so-and-so. And I was like, I didn't even know. Just because so much time has passed, right? You know, I haven't seen my mom since I've been incarcerated. And that weighs heavily on me. When I was young, my mother, she used to always try to hug me and love on me, but she was addicted to drugs. And I was always kind of like, don't hug me, stay away from me. I was a little boy, right? What young teen like wants to be hugging their mom, right? Me. <laughs> And um, that is one of my biggest regrets, is not hugging my mom every time she wanted a hug. Getting these tablets was a big deal for me. One of the first things I did was I called my sister and I told her, I want to video chat mom. I want to see mom. They're standing in the day room in North Block. It's just so surreal. On the wall, my little tablet it was my mother's face. And she was, um, she was a little self-conscious. She's like, I didn't get to do my hair. I'm like, Mom, <laughs> you look beautiful. And um, we got to laugh, and she showed me her cats. I guess she's a cat lady now. <laughs> and um, I got to see the home that like, I grew up at, right? I got to do that because... We got these tablets. You're going to be talking to dancer. We're going to try. You're going to try. try. Good luck. <laughs> I knew that you really wanted to talk to this guy, Dancer, for the story. And you and I had made a date to talk to him, but I got there first. And um, you know how things go at San Quentin. And I felt like I just had to go for it. So, mm. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, I'm glad you went for it. He's elusive, and when you see him, you got to go for it. Do you know that I'm here to talk to you? I have had bad luck with cameras. Oh, no, it's audio. Oh, yes. No oh, cameras. Yes. Can, I, can I ask you a few questions? Great. What's your name? Dancer. How do you get that name? Um, I was born with it. Oh, it's your birth name? Yes, my last name. Oh, I thought it was I like all the reindeer jokes and all that stuff. Yeah, I grew I up know, with that. I, like, I thought it was like a, a nickname. Nick, no, that's my name. Oh, okay, okay. And are you into new technology? Uh, I'm trying to catch up with it. What's the most challenging part of it? All of it. And what do you think about these new tablets? I don't know. I didn't take one. I don't want one. Period. They can keep them. Well. I came to prison when they used to hold things over your head to make you cooperate. So I'm, I, I'm structured like that. So I don't want nothing that they have to give me where they can come back later and take it because I don't do this or do that. So I just, if I want to talk to somebody, I use the telephone. There's nothing on the tablet that intrigues you? I don't know what's on it because I didn't take one. 
<laughs> was, it, was there pressure to take one? No. Um, do you think that they listen in on them? Absolutely. I wonder about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's nobody on the outside you'd like to email or talk with? Um, no, everybody that that was in touch with me, family and friends and stuff, my daughters, my sons, and my grandkids, and, and my wife, they all passed away. So I don't t- communicate with nobody. Your grandchildren? I had two grandchildren that passed away. Oh, I'm sorry, that's hard. I've a lot of deaths in the family. I've been locked up a while. Uh, how long? Um, too long, 20 plus. 20 plus, okay. So I do mine a day at a time, by myself, within myself, and I get along a lot better. I don't have no temper no more or nothing else. I found out that dealing with a lot of people gave me a lot of anxiety and I was taking it out on people that shouldn't have it taken out on me. So I, I found a way not to go through that and I don't do it anymore. Do you spend time with any of the other men that have been in prison a long time that are here? Just by everybody I do spend time with been locked up a long time because they understand we understand each other. Who are some of the other guys that you hang out with? Well, just people. You're secretive. <laughs> yes. Old school. <laughs> you don't give them no information they ain't necessary. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good rule. Yeah, yeah. It keeps you from having a lot of headaches. <laughs> He's looking at me with needles. Tony, you finally showed up. I kept peeping, peeping. Where's Tony? Where's Tony? And I looked up, and there you were. Yeah, I've been looking around everywhere for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, as someone who's been down a long time, what's it like to see all these tablets inside prison? I don't think nothing about it one way or the other. <laughs> if, if you have one, I hope you enjoy it. I do enjoy my tablet, yeah. Do you think that you feel free because you don't have a tablet? I don't feel like I'm shackled to each his own. I'm old school. I don't dictate my policies to anybody, and that's just me. When you get out, are you going to get a cell phone? No. You use a regular telephone. I understand what you're saying, but do you know how hard it is to find a phone outside now? I don't have anybody to call. If I meet somebody, they can call me. Can I ask what year you were born? 47. Okay. I had a birthday yesterday, matter of fact. Happy birthday! Yeah. Yeah. How come you don't have any wrinkles? I don't worry. Mm. Okay, that's really good advice. I don't smile that much. I read a book about it. They say you get just as much wrinkles in your face from smiling as you do from frowning. Wow. It's hard for me not to smile, though. It's not hard for me. It's easy. I'm smiling once. I'm looking at you now. I'm smiling. (laughs) (laughs) I hope that didn't give you any wrinkles. So, uh, what'd you guys think? Okay, first of all, I've got three notes for you. He sounded nervous. (laughs) I love the cold opening. I love the range of emotions, and I love the audio texture, especially when you call your mom. I mean, it's it's really beautiful. Oh, I had a note there. Where is that at? Hey, uh, Tony, just so you know, you call your mom too much. No. She didn't. She didn't. She did not want to tell you that. <laughs> She, just, she, she said it's just me. enough. She said it's just enough. Well, every day. I call my mom every day, too. Mom's <laughs> like to be called every day. My mother would have told me if it yeah. was too much. She didn't say call more. <laughs> no, she said it's just enough. Just enough. It's just right. I think it turned out well, Nye. I agree. Good story. He found great characters. I mean, to me, it was a very ear hustle story. Very ear hustle Yeah. Anyway, I, kudos to you. Nice job. Nice job. Definitely, definitely. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the San Quentin Magazine. Stories from our new team of rookie producers. And 
we've been hearing some good stuff. What do you say, Nah? Yeah, I think so. We had Steve talking about the popcorn craze, Tony DeFoya on those new tablets that everybody's getting. Tom talked about the gazebos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, a couple of the stories touch on this conversation that's been going on about making San Quentin in the image of the Norway model. Mm, We've been there. What do you think? I I think they're starting down the path. Okay. What do you think of that? The gazebos, to me, seem to be the most promising aspect of this new idea. Yeah, they're still in the parking lot. (laughs) In the parking lot. So we've heard a great range of stories, and um, we've got a few more left to hear. So we got next night. So we've got the second Tony, Tony to Trinidad, and I've heard he has this very different way of of taking on the story. So instead of interviewing people, Mm -hmm. he's actually interviewing buildings, giving them Hmm. a personality. Yep, the buildings are going to tell us stories. This should be interesting. Yes. Hey, what's up? How you doing? All right, what's going on, man? Yeah, aren't you canteen? Yeah, I'm canteen. What's oh, okay. up? What you need? So, Do I know you? Yeah, I, I really want to get into ice cream. Yeah, Tony. ice cream Tony. Yeah, that's Yeah, it. okay, what's good? <laughs> yeah, he always calls me ice cream Tony, but my name is Tony de Trinidad. And right now, I'm having a conversation with a building here at San Quentin, the canteen. When you run out of stuff, do you really run out of stuff? Or are you just like, this motherfucker played me last week. He tried to come to the window with short change me. So, no, we don't got no ice cream this week. That is certified, classified G13 information that you're asking. I know that. Hold on, hold on. You got some money? I mean, I always got You know, you pull up to this front, man. You got to have some bread, man. If you ain't got no dough, then you got to do it, you know, moving. Talking to Canteen, I realized this is the perfect opportunity to ask a question that's been on my mind lately. See, I've been at San Quentin since 2018, and I've lived in two different housing units, but I've always wondered about the other buildings. I mean, the cells are pretty much the same no matter where you live. Small and ugly, but each building has its own distinct vibe and personality. So, is there one where I'd fit in better? I wanted to see what Canteen thought about that. So... You sit in the middle of all the buildings. They all come at you asking for stuff. I'm on the blade, baby. I see everything moving. On your opinion, man, what's the best place for me to live here? Look, man, you got yourself together, man. Alpine Donner. Alpine Donner? Yeah, man. You know, I really wanted to thank you for this little sit down. Mm-hmm. You know, I just wanted your unbiased opinion on that. I knew, I knew you would come through for me, so I appreciate that. You only got five dollars left. No refunds, man. No refunds. Sorry. All right, respect. Thank you, man. All right, all right on. So Alpine Donner, that's actually two different buildings. They're both designed for those who work hard and stay out of trouble. Right now, I live in Alpine. It's a quiet, calm atmosphere. But I already know about Alpine. I'm more curious about some of the other buildings, like North Block. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing okay. How you doing? So, uh, you're North Block, right? Yeah, that's a North Block building. So this is one of my first times talking to a building. So if I say anything that's like, you know, disrespectful or I use a term that's offensive to buildings, just, you know, let me know and and I'll back up. I lock my doors, make sure you don't get in. Okay, (laughs) that'll work. See, North Block used to be the calm building, but then Alpine and Donner opened up and a lot of the guys who are what we call programmers, those are the guys who are staying out of trouble and trying to get home. Those people moved out and a lot of young guys moved in. And I hear it can be a bit chaotic. So, before, what was your typical resident like? Quiet. Old men. They wasn't off the hook like they is now. Okay. Now what's your typical resident like? Running up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs, fighting on the fifth year. So you got people running up and down your back running all day? Running down my back all day long. All that's right. why I, if you come up the stairs, look like I'm leaning. That's, that's the youngsters. What's your favorite type of resident that lives in you now? Like, do you still have some good guys in there at all? You got a few. I, got, I like the ones that leave out at 7 and come back at the end of the day. Them good guys. Do you think uh, North Block would be a right move for me? No. No? Why not? You ain't going to mix. Huh? You're not going to mix with them guys. He's a good guy. Them guys, they off the hook. Oh, so it's not my speed. It's too many of them. Okay. I, I, you know what? I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I wouldn't want to go into a crazy situation. Well, man, you have a lovely day, man. All right, thank you very much. 
Well, that was interesting, but I think I'm going to go holler at Donner next. One thing you should know about Donner is that it's like Alpine, but even more exclusive. And it's got a lot of perks, like the dog training program, and guys get their own cells. No celly. But I'm not 100% sure if I fit in there. So, hey, how you doing? Oh, blessed, as always. Could you tell us your name? Hi, I'm Donner. Because I've heard several mm-hmm. names. I don't know. Uh, like what? Like Honor Donner? I've heard Honor Donner. I've heard Donner Darlings. You know, oh, like, those are uh, cute. You like those? Yeah. Okay. That's adorable. So, I've been kind of looking around for a best place to live in San Quentin. Oh, there's no better place than Donner. What about, like, what's daily life like there? Um, It's pretty quiet and relaxed. And then they have nearly completely eliminated disrespectful posture and like aggressive verbiage and like just laziness. It's pretty amazing. The typical residents that I house are not your average person in blue. We're above average and special in so many kinds of ways. I'm not saying there's people that will tell on other people for having loud music, but... So if somebody's a programmer, they're trying their best to just figure themselves out and get home to the people they love. Absolutely. You think that'd be a good Donner resident? Only if they haven't had a write-up in the last six months. Yeah, that's that's, that's me. Mm. You think Donner would be a good fit for me? Are you part of the elite few? The I, few, the proud, the donner? I don't know if I'd ever consider myself yeah. elite. Well, I mean, you have to be a certain kind of somebody to be there. Uh, okay. Right? Yeah, I can't, I can't deny that. So listen, uh, well, yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah, but, but like, uh, what I'm trying to tell you, right, is my story. We're here to hear about me, not wrap it up. That's really cute. Well, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to oh say Oh my that. gosh. Are you mansplaining me i'm just I, like, i'm just trying to get to class man oh, you know my. i'm sorry i only had uh, schedule so much time for this yeah that was a bit much let's try badger badger's kind of the opposite of donner there are zero entry requirements and i'm sure he'll be happy to talk to me hey uh badger hey badger can i talk to you for a second yo yo i'll do no interviews bro Look, man. I, hold up. Hold, is that thing on? Man, shut that off, bro. I don't do interviews. Look, I just... It's a, no. Bro. All right, man. Big badger in the building. We don't do interviews. All right, man. I respect that. Peace. There was just one more place I needed to go. West Block. Man, I, I've been kind of thinking about what the right place for me to live in, in, in San Quentin is. And, uh... You know I, where the right place to live is? Not in San Quentin. <laughs> You know, you might be just right about In fact, I know you're right about that. But, but if uh, you got to live somewhere, you know, I guess West Block's all right. I know West Block pretty well because it's the first place I lived when I got to San Quentin. Half the building faces the rest of the prison, but the other half sits on the bay facing Mount Tamalpais. The best view in prison is from West Block's fifth tier. But when I lived there, daily life could be kind of unpredictable. Sometimes it'd be nice and calm, but other times it would just go nuts. Here we are today with a very special person. I I guess I couldn't call you a person, could I? No. My name is Wes Block, and uh, I long for, you know, watching the sunset, and I'm just hoping one day that somebody come in and, you know, pressure wash my windows. I know you've been around this place for a minute. uh, Long time. Like I heard you was off the hook for a minute. Like oh, yeah, really? you know, I seen a couple people yesterday uh, fighting over a phone, and then when they got stopped fighting, neither of them even used the phone. They just left. Where do you think I should live in San Quentin? You think I should go back to West Block, or should I stay in Alpine? Uh, I guess it depends on, you know, your, your interaction skills, right? Uh, you was all right when you was over there, so, you know, if you're comfortable where you at, I say stay where you at. And there's one question I almost didn't want to ask it, but I got to ask it. Okay. Do you miss me? I do, you know what I'm saying? Because you left things alone and you left it a little better than you than you came into it with, so it's okay. All right, West Block. 
Thank you so much. You have a beautiful day. Thank you, man. I'm looking forward to a good sunset. And uh, thank you for interviewing me and taking time to, to hear my perspective. You know what I'm saying? And, and I love you, but don't come back is what I'm saying. Straight up, I think I'm worrying about the wrong thing. Every living situation is going to have its ups and downs. I might as well make the best of it and focus on the one move I need to really worry about. And that's the move home. So until then, this is Tony the Trinidad from Ear Hustle San Quentin saying peace out. That was such an interesting take. Um, Where did that idea come from? So while we were doing our training, we listened to a podcast called Everything is Alive, where the guy interviewed a can of cola. Lewis. Yeah, and I really liked it. Yeah. I liked the concept. It was it was very interesting. Um, sometimes when you're doing interviews, you have to be able to explain to somebody what the story is, what you want. So I'm curious, how did you explain this concept to people? It actually wasn't that hard. People really took to it pretty easily. It was, it was a matter of a sentence usually. Hey, man, I want you to play the, the voice of the building. Can you do that? Yeah, what building? And it was just on from there. Wow. Mm. It's, I, you know... This is a really good example of why it's so important to listen to other people's work. When you want to learn more and get better at something, you've got to listen to what other people are doing. So good for you for taking that on. Good job. Thank you. Right on. Next up, we have Darrell Sadiq Davis. And you know what makes his different? What's that? His is done as like a diary. Okay. Yeah, so his story is going to unfold over different diary entries. Hmm. Nice idea, This should be interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm right here at the front gate by visiting, waiting for the dogs to walk through the gate. I'm so anxious, me and my partner right here, Carrington, waiting to pick up the supplies and the dog. Junebug is a service dog that I'm about to train. I've been waiting a month and a half now, just waiting for her to come in, just anticipating it. It's part of a program here at San Quentin where we, where we take these dogs in and we train them to be service animals. And I'm going to have Junebug for about a month. And it's been like a whole lot of uh, less sleeping, just tossing and turning, getting ready for this day, and it's finally here. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> get the cord, get the cord. <laughs> so Junebug just jumped at the mic. She jumped at what we call a dead cat. The dead cat is a cover for the mic to protect it from the wind. Junebug is going to be a handful. Looking everywhere, she's like confused. She's like, what's going on? What is going on? What is going on? This is something that she's never seen. She's making me more confused now. Are you more nervous now that there's a lot of people walking around? Yeah, so now I have to be mindful of, you know, these types of things, all these people walking around. I can just imagine on the street. Because you got to keep an eye on her and keep an eye on the surroundings and make sure she's not overstimulated. So now I'm about to head back to the building, take all the supplies back, and just get acquainted with her. And she don't know how to stop moving. And I don't know how to stop being jittery. <laughs> Today is uh, Saturday, July 8th. As soon as Junie seen me, she started wagging her tail. I was like, hey, mama, hey, mama. I spoke. She instantly jumped at me, responding with joy. Our walk from the cell to work was a struggle because she's curious about everything. She wants to pick up everything. She wants to lick everything. She wants to chew on everything. So I got to constantly watch her. Every little thing that she put in her mouth, I had to take out. Old orange pillings, something that looked like some old bologna meat, sticks, sometimes rocks. I'm on like daddy duties with her, basically. And I'm scanning the floor everywhere. As soon as I walked in, I had my, I had my vacuum eyes on. So now it's midnight, but as I was woken up by Junebug tossing and turning, she has a bed set up just right under my bed. She was just grunting, like just... Like kind of whining just a little bit. My first instinct was she was having a bad dream. And I thought maybe it's nothing, uh, or maybe I'm tripping. So I went back to sleep. About 30 minutes or so, she was doing the same thing again. So I put my hand on her to see if she was cold, and yes, that's what it was. Her body was a little cold. 
So I took my sheet that I was wrapped in and just put it on her. She went fast asleep, but now I was just up watching her, feeling proud like I accomplished something. <laughs> it's crazy. I stayed up for about 45 minutes and maybe an hour just to make sure. I feel like a dad watching his baby girl in the cradle or something. I don't know. Who knows? Being with Junebug reminds me of my daughter. Uh, I wasn't there for my daughter when she was born. I wasn't there for the birth. I saw her for the first time in county jail right after I got arrested, but it was only behind the glass. Then I was shipped off to Calipatra State Prison near Baja, California. I was in Calipatra for 10 years. So it was, it was definitely too far for her to come visit with her mom, so I didn't see her for all of that time. Then in 2022, I came to San Quentin, which was about an hour from where she lives. I remember the first visit. So when you first come into visiting, everybody get their hugs out the way, hugs and kisses. When it came time for her to hug me, she kind of came in with her head down. She was all shy and stuff, and she gave me like a side hug with one arm. But I still embraced her because I knew what it was at the time. And then we sat down and she couldn't even look at me for a long time. It took about an hour for her to actually just look at me and talk because she was just so nervous. I was nervous too, but I just kept looking at her and I kept telling her like, you're actually my daughter, you look just like me. And just being with Junebug always remind me of the little things that I've missed with my daughter and the things that I wanna do with my daughter when I get out, just spend time with her. Okay, June, it's time to go. So me and Junebug just headed to the West Block Yard so she could play around a little bit. It's called, what we call it a little doggy park that we set up on the West Block Yard. Junebug is a little aggressive in her playfulness, but she likes to establish her dominance. Don't you, girl? And then we like, okay, okay, now it's time for the water. They all run into the same bowl, which is crazy. They fighting to get their licks in. So right now she's kind of like laying down like right by my feet with her eyes open. I know you, I know you hear me. Speak. Speak, Junie. Huh? Speak. Speak. Good girl. He's a good girl. Is it on? Is it on? I'm going? So, uh. The program with Junebug was supposed to be for a month, but three weeks in, we, we got this email saying that uh, they were taking two dogs, so they were supposed to just take Artemis and Wendell. But when an email came in, it had Junebug's name on it. Some of the guys came up like, it might just be a typo, it might just be a typo. This morning when they came, the lady Susan was like, so we taking Artemis, Wendell, and Junebug. I put Junebug's vest on her. I put her leash on. Then we went out for our Friday training routines one last time. I gave Junebug a hug and gave her some treats. Then I handed the leash over to Susan. And I watched her disappear behind the wall. So I just jumped in the shower and tried to wash it off, you know, but I think I'm still a little sad, you know, not too sad, but you probably can see it on my face, maybe. It feels like uh, not having somebody when you was just so attached to that person and they just up and just leave without any uh, explanation. When I was a child, my dad just up and left. I ended up finding out that he went to prison when I was a kid, but I didn't know at the time. And I never seen him for a long time, and it's kind of like felt like that, like you just up and leave one day and not know what's going on. And your mom just telling you, oh, he left, he'll be back, and he never came back. So it kind of feel like that a little bit. I'm a little sweaty, a little hot, and I'm a little uh, distraught. I feel distraught. So if you was to freestyle a poem right now about your dog that you just lost in a country song or something, what would it be? <laughs> 
Oh, man. Oh, I miss my dog. I miss my dog. Where's Junie going to? I miss my dog. Oh, Junie, come back, because I miss my dog. Whoever would have thought I'd make a song about you On a Friday way back in July That's when you walked through You came into my life I knew you'd make it right I never cared about what you used to do I looked into your eyes And I smile Oh, Junebug Come on back to me I miss my dog I miss my dog Oh, Junebug, where are you going to? I miss my dog Oh, Junie, come back Because I miss my dog. I did not see that song coming. Wait, wait, you suggested it, I thought. I was just bullshitting. (laughs) I was just clowning, and he took that serious. I'm glad he did, because I love that part of the story. Well. It's so charming. Yeah, yeah, he he did his thing. You know, he did his thing. Uh, (laughs) What do you think about his story, though? I really like that he decided to do it as a diary, diary entries. We haven't really done that before. And, you know, part of his diaries, he he brought in the conversation about his daughter, you yeah. know, not being around her and, you know, building that relationship mm-hmm. back up. So, yeah. what'd you say? Good job? I say good job, Sadiq. Definitely good job. Oh, Junie, come back. Because I miss my dog. So, Naj, how do you think it went? Well, you know what I really like the most about doing it is that it allowed these guys to experiment and sort of push the boundaries of what they know right now Mm -hmm. and that each person's um, kind of way of being comes across in their story, right? There's five very different ways of telling stories. And I I think that bodes well for creativity to come. I can tell you what I'm waiting on. What's that? The pitch session at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see, you know, who come with the best ideas. Mm -hmm. So we definitely going to see. I like it. My name is Rashid Zinnerman, sound designer for Ear Hustle. And I just finished helping produce that wonderful song you just heard. Special thanks to Katie Gilbert, Officer Wallace, and John Zaretsky, who played the fiddle. Ear Hustle was produced by Nigel Poor, Erline Woods, Amy Standen, Bruce Wallace, and Rasan New York Thomas. Shebnam Sigmund is the managing producer. The producing team inside includes Steve Brooks, Darrell Sadiq Davis, Tony de Trinidad, Thom Nguyen, and inside managing producer Tony Tafoya. Erline Woods sound designs and engineers the show with help from Fernando Aruda. Rashid Zinnerman, myself, and Darrell Sadiq Davis. Thanks to Acting Warden Smith at San Quentin, Acting Warden Hill, and Lieutenant Newborg at the California Institution for Women for their support of the show. Thanks also to this woman here. I am Lieutenant GMRA Berry, the Public Information Officer at San Quentin Rehabilitation Center, and I approve this episode. This episode was made possible by The Just Trust, working to amplify the voices, vision, and power of communities that are transforming the justice system. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on Ear Hustle's website, earhustlesq.com. You can also find out more about the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Ear Hustle SQ. Back to you, Erline and I. Please don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And while you're at it, sign up for our newsletter, The Lowdown. Subscribe at EarHustleSQ.com slash newsletter. Music for this episode comes from Antoine Williams, David Jossie, Fernando Arruda, Rashid Zinnerman, Greg Sayers, Darrell Sadiq Davis, and Matthew Jaspar. 
Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Discover audio with vision at radiotopia.fm. I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods. Thanks Thanks for listening. I grab it with my gummy part of my mouth, and then, you know, I, I swish the kernels around, you know, and then I make them a little bit soft, and then I, I crunch them on both sides. That way I get that buttery flavor all the way out when I do it like that. Radiotopia.